Okay, so let's have a little look at uh, current technology in uh, IT, computing, and possibly some of the things that we can look to in the future. So we'll have a look at uh, computing, the computing industry now and then. My name is Professor Bill Buchanan, and I'm going to outline a few important areas that are really uh, taking major steps forward. The first one, and one that uh, is really going to be a massive industry of the future, is obviously big data. So more and more companies uh, are relying on, on the data that they gather from their systems and from open source information to be able to analyse how the customers operate and the best approaches for them. Along with uh, big data, as more and more information is stored in the cloud and so on, then we have an increasing importance for cyber security. So with that, we have Bob and we have Alice, and unfortunately we have Eve in between. One of the largest growth areas just now and into the future is cloud computing. So more and more we're building systems almost like the mainframes of the past, and we're using that to be able to store information with inside cloud systems, either private or public clouds, and then really building high performance computing uh, infrastructures. And then we're seeing massive move forward in terms of healthcare. So we could see uh, things that could improve healthcare really built within the cloud and using mobile devices. So first let's look at cloud computing. So what's this little device? Just give you a little minute to have a look at that. Well, that's actually a, a tube or a vacuum device. Uh, and this, these, this is a computer of the past. This is ENIAC in 1950s. It had over 17,000 of these vacuum tubes or valves consumed about 150,000 watts and weighed 30 tonnes. Then in the 1960s we got this little device that came along and that's called a transistor. Transistor revolutionised the industry. So we can now move away from these uh, valves uh, towards these little small transistor devices. And then IBM started to create computers which uh, used the transistors and were more powerful and uh, were obviously smaller. To give you some idea, this was these, the System 360 was only about 0 0.034 MIPS. It had one megabyte of memory and had 32-bit processing, cost about a quarter of a million dollars. Then Intel came along and said, well, why don't we create a, an integrated circuit, a device which has many transistors on it, and we'll package it into a, a chip. And the 404 was the first, that's a 4-bit processor. And then after that we saw the growth of personal computers, such as for Apple, who created their Apple One computer. The original one was really a wooden one. And then we had devices such as the Sinclair ZX Spectrum using the Z80 processor, only had about 4K of memory. Then uh, we saw the 16-bit processors come along, such as in 1978 with the Intel 886. And IBM took that processor and created a PC. So this is uh, a 1981, was the year of that. And IBM had a massive share of the market at the time before the PC came along, especially focused on mainframes. And with the PC, they took a departure where they used non-standard, uh, they took standard components off the shelf and, and built the PC around them. And that allowed others to come along and, and make use of their system. And one person who uh, made full use of it was a young Bill Gates, who created Microsoft. And Microsoft built up a whole industry of creating the operating system for the, the PC, then on to Windows and so on. By 1982, we got this little compact, this little uh, mobile uh, uh, computer called the Compact Compact, 1982. 
seems quite large by today's standards. And then by 1984, Apple uh, re released their their famous Apple Mac uh, and it was there to really break the stranglehold that IBM had on the industry at the, at the time. So let's look at what's really happened with uh, computers. We started with standalone ones. We then decided that we could actually network them together. So we created network computers. That was quite good because we could actually start to share resources the company who created many of the standards related to networking were actually Xerox. In their park uh, research organization, they created Ethernet, they created the graphical user interface, the mouse, and many other things. Other companies went on to make full usage of, the, of them, especially Apple, uh, when Steve Jobs actually seen the possibilities that uh, were there for the mouse, the graphical user interface, and Ethernet. So then the next step towards that was from a network PC to be uh, an infrastructure where we could actually start to share resources, share DLLs, share programs, and, and so on. And that's a shared infrastructure. Where we're now is really moving away from that, and we're moving into the cloud. So we get the concept of thin clients. Thin clients are like graphical interfaces or terminals which access programs which run with inside the cloud. So we don't need complicated hardware to be able to access complex programs. We can build our applications through linking services together into web apps. This is called service oriented architecture and it's really revolutionizing the software industry. And many companies are moving towards this type of architecture for building their whole IT infrastructure. So really the extension to this is the creation of uh, clustered infrastructures or really building a mainframe again in the cloud. So with this what we can actually do is we take lots of data sources, lots of disks, lots of CPUs, lots of graphics cards and RAMs together and we cluster them together to create a larger computing infrastructure. So if we had uh, say 16 gigabytes of memory on one, on 10 computers we cluster them together we now have a pool of 160 gig. Same with CPUs we might have four CPUs on one machine if we brought together another four of them then we can have 16 CPUs. So it really starts to build a, a computing infrastructure uh, which is uh, clustered and where we can actually share resources. Okay, so let's look at, the f at uh, another area and that's uh, related to botnets and denial service. So let's uh, draw a few computers here. Okay, so these might be old computers or computers that haven't been patched for a long time. Many of those exist on the internet. And here we have uh, our intruder. Our intruder then writes an email, which will be a phishing email that will be sent to our three computers here. Now, the, f the three main formats that uh, our intruder will p possibly use in terms of compromising them are Adobe Flash, Adobe PDF and Oracle Java. These three formats have serious problems on unpatched systems and can compromise them so that the computers become a bot or part of a botnet. Okay, so Eve sends out a phishing email and then the user opens it up, it could be an HMRC link or so on, opens it up, a flash file, PDF or a Java, and then there is now a bot on these machines. So what happens next is the bot calls home and calls back to what's called the botnet master. So there's the botnet master here. The botnet master will then download the updated bot to the machines. And then once they're there, the botnet master will send a command to the bots to be able to do something such as steal data from another computer or, in this case, uh, perform a denial of service against uh, a certain uh, machine on the internet. OK, 
Okay, so in that case we create what's called the distributed denial of service flood and it can exhaust the resources of the machine. So there are a whole lot of these bots that are existing and we can actually look at them uh, in terms of a, of a map. So here is a real-time trace just now. This is the HoneyNet uh, project and this actually shows uh, a real-time activity of uh, real botnets that we can see. There's a lot of activity around here quite a lot of activity here too and Romania and so on you can see there's a bit in uh, in the USA and, and so on okay so you can see that uh, that we can look in real time uh, as to investigate these these uh, these bots and that's what's called a honey net that's a that's a an infrastructure where where the the, the bots are are trapped into a honeypot. Okay, so you can have a look at that at map.honeynet.org. So there are various other ones like the Trent Micro Global Botnet Threat Graph. Here's one here. So in this case, we can see there are three thousand seven hundred thirty-one active command and control centers. That's the the botnet master and there are nearly 10 million uh, active botnet connections over the last 14 days. So you can see it's a, it's a major problem on the internet uh, and these bots can obviously be taken over. We can also look at other types of charts. Uh, in this case we can see that the US uh, has, has many attacks within inside uh, that time frame. And this one here gives us a basic uh, graphic of the, the current threats at any given time. Okay, we can see Russia and China are the top nations there for, for that type of uh, attack. So let's look at the Rogues Gallery. <laughs> and the Rogues Gallery is these three file formats here. PDF is... Uh, vulnerabilities are typically defined with a CVE number and these CVE numbers, this the PDF one goes back to 2007 it's the it's the flash flash player vulnerability and then we have a PDF one and finally we have a Java exploit uh, these are typical with inside exploit kits which can be purchased with full service level agreements uh, from uh, uh, crime gangs and, and, and so on And this shows you an example of uh, some of the problems that we can have with uh, with hacked accounts. So this was the the Adobe hack. 150 million accounts were compromised here. We can see that the top password was actually one two three four five six, used by nearly two million people, followed by one two three four five six seven eight nine, then password and so on. So you can see that uh, that some systems have passwords which are normally easily uh, cracked. And this is a particular problem just now and this is related to what's called cross-site scripting or XSS and this is an example of SQL injection. What we see here is an SQL command that uh, that will actually take what the user enters as, in a, as a username and a password builds up an SQL statement uh, and then that will release back their, uh, their their account details. What the third statement shows there is that the intruder adds uh, inverted comma or one equals one hyphen hyphen and what that does is that that will be true for every single account on the user database which then releases all the usernames and passwords this is called mass harvesting and it happened on uh, it was discovered that a Russian based criminal gang had stole 1.2 billion usernames and passwords 500 million email addresses by using this type of method and using botnets to be able to go and harvest information so it would have been very difficult to actually trace the original sources of the intrusion because it was botnets that were using these calls into the into the web servers. 
Okay, so that that's our cyber security. So a, a big uh, area at the present time, but an area that's really growing is uh, is big data, and big data is all about analysing data from many different sources, billions and trillions of records, and trying to make some sense of it. And really, what's happening is that we're all leaving digital shadows. We uh, store photos on the internet, we use Facebook, we post to forums, we have Twitter accounts and our mobile phones are, are really tracing our uh, location. Okay, so let's look at some of the traces of information that we actually leave behind. Obviously one is around the computers that we use and there can be traces of files and contents web logs and so on can all appear on, on our computer systems. Even though we've deleted a file, it can still actually be on our machine. There are server logs every time we access a server, then it will actually appear as as a log on a server. We have Facebook logs, Twitter, uh, our Twitter feeds and so on. And this shows an example of how we can actually analyse uh, some Twitter feeds. Okay, so here we go. This is this is analysing all the Twitter feeds for the last few years of an account. We can see uh, the grey as the tweets, and we can see when most of the activity is. So you can actually see that seven o'clock is really when this person gets up, and then uh, fairly dominant, uh, fairly uh, there's not so many tweets between twelve and six o'clock in the morning. So let's have a little look at this. Okay, so this is our analytics here. So what we can do is we can actually scroll and we can actually locate certain times. So let's let's see if we can uh, have a look at this one here. So we can see in this part here, uh, there was something that was retweeted uh, quite a lot here. So with this type of analytics, we can actually have a little look to see what the actual uh, tweet was in this case it was related to tweet deck and so on and then that was uh, uh, tweeted out okay so you can actually analyze through tweets uh, and build up timelines and look at uh, basic activity from uh, them okay so so through big data you can actually start to look at things like sentiment analysis and so on and to try and understand uh, different perceptions on uh, on data then we have our mobile devices which are really uh, logging calls and so on and then they're also tracing they're also uh, archiving location information into these types of logs so this shows an example if you use an Android phone, then all your location information is typically stored into the Google Cloud. The same thing happens with a, an Apple phone. And we can see here, here's a, a journey between Edinburgh to Glasgow and back again. You can see the journey started at 8 o'clock and then went right on till about 2 o'clock in, in the afternoon. And you can actually see there was no travel in between 9 o'clock and 1 o'clock there. Okay, so this is the type of thing that we would get. So here we go, and it's there. So we can actually take, we can actually go through the whole of the journey, and there we go. So there we go. The there's the arrival there at the place. So what we can actually go, uh, we can actually zoom in to there and actually see where it was. So so Android is is. Uh, is continually uh, logging information. It uses a, a typically uses assisted GPS so that it will try to trace even though it can't get a GPS signal. So we can see in here that's the that's the actual location there and we can actually trace uh, where the journey actually took and where we actually ended up after, after a while. Okay, so so with this with this information, we can actually uh, a lot of information stored with inside uh, the uh, cloud infrastructures that that can actually be used to analyze things like carbon footprints and so on. And then we got things like LinkedIn posts and so on. 
So there's a whole lot of data that can actually be gathered on users. Some of it is things that the user is giving to uh, at the open open source. Uh, others are 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 gathered ubiquitously uh, as as the user uses the internet. And we obviously have things like the NSA that, uh, that that possibly monitor network traffic. Okay, so who's who's actually watching? Uh, well, obviously, uh, Google uh, is a is a prime source of uh, of of uh, watching uh, our user activity. So what can happen is that uh, Google might uh, drop a session cookie onto machine, and then we have uh, the possibility of uh, ad choices. So with ad choices, there's a whole lot of uh, advertising companies who have subscribed to uh, pushing forward adverts from their clients. So in this case, what we can actually see, there's the ad choice symbol, the little the little bluey green uh, triangle there, like a play symbol. And what's happened is that the user's been looking for furniture and has went to this horoscope page. Uh, the uh, the page has left a places for these ad choices to go, and then based on the the user's uh, searching, uh, it's actually pushed forward advertisements that is really optimized for their interests at that given time. So have a look the next time you see an advertising post on a web page, and it might relate to something that you've actually searched for fairly recently. Okay, so the next thing we'll have a look, look at is uh, healthcare, and with healthcare, uh, really, we're now moving into into a time when computers are getting much more powerful in terms of their intelligence. So this is one of the first things that that identified that really computers were actually quite powerful when in 1997 Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov at chess. Then it happened. Uh, that uh, uh, Watson, the IBM Watson, beat the humans at, at Jeopardy in 2001. So Jeopardy involves finding out the answer, the question to an answer. So it's quite a difficult thing for a computer to understand the, the basic semantics of uh, our English language. So what Watson basically did was it just waited and until the contestant was about to press the button and then it would find its best answer and get in before them. Then the uh, latest Watson uh, beat lung cancer, cancer specialists uh, in predicting uh, lung cancer. Basically it went to med school and learned everything it could about uh, lung cancer. So it, it was given uh, logs, uh, it was given x-rays and images, it uh, read uh, from all the, the, the wiki uh, posts related to the subject and so on, and it generally learned how to diagnose uh, lung cancer. And we're also seeing uh, a great increase with mobile phones to be able to measure things like heart rate, blood pressure and, and so on. And this is really focused on, on mobile health. Along with this, really the cloud has been used more and more to be able to diagnose and also to, to monitor. So we have expert systems, clinical support systems online. And then obviously, we're now using big data analysis to be able to improve healthcare. Okay, so that was just a very quick uh, introduction to some of the up and coming technologies.